and the leaders of the mindfulness movement. Mindfulness means paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in the present moment, and non-judgmentally. By the way, this is John Kabat-Zinn. By the way, our human brain is absolutely incapable of not judging. So anybody who tells you that, the closest you can come to it is suspending your judgment. But this brain is, is created for judging. Because if it wasn't, you would, you would be eaten by the tiger and you would not even make any move or protect yourself. That's what the function of the brain is. But to be able to suspend it, maybe you could do that. You say, well, I'm thinking that my husband did, but let me see if I can consult with someone, if I can say a prayer about this. Maybe I can just you know, hold it and not act on it. Yeah, that, with practice, we might be able to do that. This kind of attention nurtures greater awareness. This is the goal of mindfulness. Clarity, that means, you know, oh, maybe my husband didn't do it. And acceptance of present moment. Acceptance of present moment is something which is unique to the mindfulness process because that's really all they are dealing with. This process does not deal with the future, with the goals of the future, with the goals of humanity, none of those things. Only the moment and how you handle the moment. So are you able to pause, take deep breath, and figure out, unless somebody is really you know, coming at your child in the middle of the of, uh, highway, and I would recommend no mindfulness. Go get the person, go get the kid. <laughs> okay. Now, again, John Kabat-Zinn, he says, just watch this moment, he um, suggests, without trying to change it at all. So this is not about having a better idea, or God says, you know, don't go rob the uh, castle of the king. <laughs> it's none of those things. It's just being aware. You're going to rob the castle of the king. That's what you're doing, and that's what you're doing. You're watching it. You don't judge it. You don't say this is good, this is bad. That's all you do. And it says, then what do you feel? After a great deal of attention to our feeling, are we, am I feeling anxious? Am I feeling calm? Am I feeling peaceful? So you become good in detecting one of the parts of your system that gives you signal, which is very important, by the way, that is used in therapy. Actually, when I started my practice, all they wanted to do to, do, to know is how people were feeling. I said to myself, my goodness, I come from a culture that they, they value the way we think. So is anybody interested in the way I think? <laughs> and they, they were not. At that time, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy was not yet anything, so nobody was interested. All they were interested was feeling. And now, by the way, uh, for those of you who have happened to visit a therapist, which is wonderful because they are there to help us, they are becoming to second thought this extraordinary, unuseful notion of, okay, how do you feel? And then leaving the person in the, in the rot of how they feel. Okay, fine, they feel upset. Well, what are you gonna do with it? That's a question. So, um, so what do you hear and all those things? So that's, that's the notion of it. And so as a result, you're going to be, um, have the, um, have the uh, notion, there are 300 kind of feelings in the English language. And by the way, those of you who visit the writings and the, um, let's say, long obligated prayer, there are mentions and uh, references to feelings that you do not see in any other place. Such as, my heart melted within me and my blood boiled in my veins. You do not find that anywhere. So really, learning how to tune ourselves how to tune our emotions to the spiritual realm is taught to us through the writings. So that is our tuning fork, to know when to be sad, when to be happy, when to be high, when to be low, not the material uh, waves that come and goes and it, as it was, it's really of no or consequence or not much of a consequence. So that's why Baha'u'llah uh, tells us, he says, obey my commandments for the love of me. So if we don't know what is love of him, we will not know how to obey him. And we will not obey him. 
So those of us who are dull in our ability to really recognize our emotions, we will not be able to really be very good lovers of the beloved. We can't because we just don't have what it takes. Because the relationship with Baha'u'llah is not a cognitive relationship. It's an emotional relationship. And when we don't have this emotional relationship, we don't do very well in our marriages either. Because we can be hijacked by other things. And if the, uh, our, our, our uh, beloved partner comes and says, you know, that makes me really upset when you're driving so fast, I get nervous. We say, what the heck, you know, I'm not doing anything. I'm just going, you know. You want me to just do it your way? So we would defend ourselves. We, won't, we don't say, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm making you feel uncomfortable. I don't want to do that, you know, which is, the, which, is the, which is really walking with the other person, feeling with the other person, having empathy, cognitive empathy, emotional empathy. These are things that we develop when we read the writings, when we read the prayers of Abdul Baha, when we go to the, uh, we stand up with the obligatory prayers, says, make my prayer fire. That we burn away the vein that has uh, shut me out from my that beauty. We are going in chase of these beauties, emotional journey. It's not a comedy journey. <laughs> so, so, knowing our emotion and having mm, a recognition of our mystical, the mystical feeling, it's absolutely necessary for us to travel with with Baha'u'llah and travel with Abu Baha. So. Now, <laughs> um, for those of you who are, um, and, and I have people ask me, by the way, oh, I'm going to go to a uh, meditation uh, weekend, and what do you think? And uh, they have all kinds of notions about the going in there and completely blanking their mind, and, uh, and um, well, I tell you something, they go over there and they're going to be big, very surprised. The, uh, the unrush of just comes, garbage comes out of their brain. Because that's how our brain is. So it's like, do I have garlic breath? Um, is there enough oxygen here? Or um, my leg is about to fall off. I wonder if I can, if I can, you know, I'm going to faint. Yeah, these thoughts are going to come. But in mindfulness, you're supposed to just watch it. Don't some, some mindfulness uh, processes, you just watch what's happening. And don't get perturbed, don't get upset, just let it happen. Okay, the waves are happening over there, and you're standing over here and you're watching it. Another type of mindfulness practice, you bring your mind back like a yo-yo. You say, oh, no, 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 come over here, come over here. That's not, you know, on the breath, on the breath. You just keep your, keep your focus on the breath. I don't want you to be running around. And so this practice of bringing it back to the breath, hopefully it will calm the mind, calm the brain, and then it will be focused for a few seconds but not longer than that. So you have to be really realistic about this whole notion, not to get perturbed that your mind is not going to stay still. And um, so there is another kind where they um, claim that mindfulness really deals with um, depression, anxiety. Uh, one of the wonderful um, scientists, uh, Daniel Goleman. How many of you know Daniel Goleman? Daniel Goleman, I would definitely suggest you read his three classics. One is emotional intelligence, one is social intelligence, and the newest work is focus. It's about attention, attention deficit, what's happening to our attention, multitasking, brilliant, brilliant work. Daniel Goleman um, talks about, do not ever think that mindfulness practice will be a substitute for psychotherapy. Absolutely not. Why? Because just observing yourself doing crazy stuff is good, I mean, but it's not going to teach you what not to do and how not to do it. And a therapist's job is to do that. However, I think, I believe, that many of us can use the writings. Can use the writings. We do use it regularly in meditation and in reflection, in consultation, and also in consultation. We learn a lot of wisdom because the greatest tool to come closest to the truth in this world is what? Consultation. Consultation. There is no other. Coming close. We're not going to ever know absolute truth or wrong or right. 
But when we have consensus in consultation, we have come closest. So respecting that tool of consultation. Now, um, the light is on it, but you can see how thousands and thousands of people come together in different parts of the world in the name of mindfulness. But there is something very unique about it which is different than this gathering here. What do you think is the difference? They are, each one of those people are really um, trapped or uh, secluded in their own thought process, separate from the rest. They have no idea what the values each, the person sitting next to them carry. For all we know, they could be somebody with values that would be blow you away if you realize what they think or what they believe. <laughs> But the thing is, you will never know because they're not going to talk about it. Actually, they're not talking about anything. They're just going to be looking at what's happening in their brain and they're not going to share it with you. And you do the same thing. So this, process, this whole notion of unity does not happen. While Paula says, Oh, my servants, free thyself from the feathers of this world mm -hmm. and lose thy soul from the prison of self. Baha'u'llah talks about the prison of self. Which self is this? The lower self. Yes, the higher self, which is exactly the will of Baha'u'llah, we need to enter in that. In order to move from the lower self, reign of lower self, we need to free ourselves from it. We need to say, no, no, I'm not going to gossip. I'm not going to see faults in other people. I'm not going to yell and scream and, uh, and, and get angry. So that is a, a practice, a daily practice that we do when we stand up and say, Oh God, please, do not look upon my hopes and my doings. Nay, rather, look upon thy will that has encompassed the heavens and the earth. And by just looking for that will, just wanting to know what it is, we become actually curious. And that curiosity, that focus, that wanting to find, will ultimately guide us. We will find someone to consult with, we will find a prayer to consult with, ultimately we liberate ourselves and we fly out of the cage. So, what mindfulness, John Kabat-Zinn says, is the best way to capture a moment is to pay attention. Yeah, he's right. This is how we cultivate mindfulness, and he is right. This is secular mindfulness. Mindfulness, means being awake, just. Some of you who are tired, they work very hard all day, you might take a nap right here, which is fine. Um, <laughs> it means knowing what you're doing. That means taking responsibility for your thoughts, taking responsibility for your feelings, taking responsibility for your decisions, taking responsibility for your actions. It doesn't say, oh well, you know what, I was too tired, so that's why I, got, I did that and that. That's defending, that's not taking responsibility. And really, in all relationships, we need to be able to take responsibility for our thoughts, our actions. And that's what you say at the beginning of the spiritual assembly, that our thoughts, our views, our feelings may become as one reality. That means all the members of the assembly manifesting the spirit of union throughout the world. Then we become a spiritual assembly. Until then, we were just a bunch of people sitting there around the table. That's not a spiritual assembly. In our assembly, we say nine prayers, everybody says prayers, and then we say an opening prayer for us just to walk into the gate of being a spiritual assembly. So, uh, as you see, the beach is, is the place um, they can come together, but not really together. Um, why mindfulness uh, meditation spread in the West? Um, basically, if you, I want to summarize it, it was a lot of um, things were right. Internet was there, the environment, the political environment was right. Um, very prominent people in the field, like John Kabat-Zinn, like um, Daniel Goleman, they went to India, they, they were practicing Buddhist. Maybe they did not like the control that the, 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 the Christian clergy had over the people here. They found that they can really carve their own way of worshiping. That's my guess. Uh, so they gave a lot of effort and time and um, ingenuity to make this a, something that the world would embrace it. If they went to Google, they went to the army, they, it's everywhere now. 
I mean, literally, it's everywhere. I remember one time, um, we were doing an empowerment program in Pomona Unified School District with kids. Unfortunately, we were able to um, uh, use uh, many of the Baha'i values, such as oneness of humanity, um, love for humanity, elimination of racism, equality of men and women, um, being illumined, all of these values we could use, and the kids would sing the songs, and they sing the prayer, make this youth radiant, and the principal and the superintendent, they all love it, because this is helping the kids, my goodness, you can see. Um, but some years ago, somebody started a meditation program at the school, and some people at the school absolutely axed it, because they said, this is not a Christian practice. So you see, so this, all these things were basically now being taken away from as an as obstacle. Um, so compatibility with Western values means basically secular. You, they did not want it to be a competition for anybody's religion. So it doesn't matter whether you had a religion or you didn't have a religion. Now you thought or you think you're spiritual, which I really do not know what, what did they mean by that. So we have to kind of... Mm, look at that whole notion of what it means to be spiritual. For, for me as a Baha'i, um, spiritual means I am able to reflect the, the light of the universal uh, light. Then I am spiritual, and there are certain criteria for that. Um, so some of the um, effort that they did was to really um, attract the attention of many scientists. I remember maybe about, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago, I went to a conference in San Francisco for mental health professionals, and that was the first conference. There were 300 people. The first time they came and they talked why religion is important, that we don't have a sense of self. Well, that, was, that was like a shock for many of the, all the therapists. There's no self, eh? so who are we? Um, and then um, they talked about meditation. One researcher came from Arizona. It was the first, and they were so excited about it. And now everywhere, everywhere is mindfulness. So, the, the physical um, aspects of mindfulness, I don't have any um, really argument about it because science looks at it and it comes down, but definitely um, claiming that um, it's dealing with the post-traumatic stress and depression, oh, absolutely not. And science does not at all support that. So um, therapy has to come into that. Um, science examines the brain and its function. Uh, but some years ago, uh, one of the gurus now who's a psychiatrist out of UCLA, he was in UCLA, um, Daniel Siegel, uh, wrote his first book. I remember at that workshop, I was just blown away. For the first time, he, the book was called uh, The Developing Mind. For the first time, he separated the mind from brain. Oh, I was like tickled. I said, wow, that's not really nice. I, I especially asked him, I said, you really, are you really separating the two from the, up to now? Everybody was telling that they are the same. He said, no, this is it. And he became one of the really um, um, people in the frontier of mindfulness. And he had to be walking very, very carefully because they could ask him. Uh, but now mm, the ground is safe. Um, so our brain is designed for some near threat, as I said, this is Daniel Goleman, like a tiger approaching, but it is blind to the microscopic and macroscopic, microscopic changes to the global system that support life on the planet, and that's where the damage is being done. Daniel Goleman is concerned that this mindfulness business is going to appease a lot of people and blind them to further search for remedies that is approaching us like the global mm, climate change, like wars, like the, whatever is coming, tsunamis that are coming our way. Um, I mean, this mindful business, business that somebody sits down and they become focused on themselves is not going, it's going to really leave us vulnerable to the things that Baha'u'llah warns us. So, the other person that is wonderful to look at um, is, by the way, what time do we have? Are you going to be very mindful? <laughs> so how much time do we have? Okay, so in about 10 minutes, would you let me know? Because I want to be able to leave some room for your questions, okay? 
Um, so uh, another person, neuroscientist, who did, has done a lot is um, uh, Dr. Neuberg. And he wrote this book called How God Changes Your Brain. Basically, the gist of it is this. Whoever is your God, if your God is money, if your God is angry, if your God is kind, if your God is um, someone who basically, um, the minute somebody does something wrong, they're going to send them to hell. Whoever is your God, um, you, your brain is going to become that. Because none of us, he explains it, none of us really have the same kind of God as everybody else. What we believe as God is unique to ourselves, even as Baha'is, because we have a kind of a way of looking at it. I mean, we, we might be a lot more close to one another, but Baha'u'llah says God is an unknowable essence, but ultimately when we come to kind of imagine it, it's going to be the figment of our imagination. For the Baha'i um, uh, revelation, the believers at least have the, the willingness to sit together and listen to one another. They're not intimidated by each other's you know, image of God. But my goodness, don't you dare to go and talk to somebody else who's coming from a belief that you're going to be challenging their way of looking at God, they're not going to be happy. I went to a funeral you know, just a, um, a little while ago. I, not very far. This was a Muslim funeral, and I had no idea. They told me that there's a the, the cemetery specially designed se segments to every religion. So I go there. Literally, it is walled. And then there was a um, there was a um, family member um, who said, "My goodness, even in death we are separated from one another. What is this?" <laughs> so people are noticing these these things that they did not notice before. Mm. So. <coughs> This whole notion, um, whatever you think, whatever, whichever way you think, that's why when you sit down and say a prayer, um, the Salam of you prayer, or a hidden word, as you're saying it, as you are diving into the metaphors in that prayer, your wiring of your brain is starting to change. Literally, that's transformation. So don't underestimate the power of that transformation. Um, especially with attention. When mindfulness came to the West, one of the things that was left behind, this is Daniel Bowman, who himself is a very practicing Buddhist. One of the things which was left behind was the ethical dimension which underlies that technique. The technique is, uh, in isolation, can be used to justify anything, even violence. That's Danny Goldman saying that. I think the Dalai Lama's take on this is quite interesting. What he says is that the secular use of mindfulness is not going to make people saints or change their values, but is going to lessen their suffering. So what Baha'u'llah says, he says, if you, if you suffer for my, my, for my sake, what better is that? That's what the Baha'is in Iran are sitting in the prison. Because they join with Baha'u'llah and Abu Baha in, in, in what they, sh they share that experience. What else are we, are we thinking that is better? A few more hamburgers, a few more pizzas, I don't know. <laughs> so, so mm, yeah, so, now, by the way, um, the gurus of mindfulness, they like to bring Buddha into the picture. But it's not easy because people are not... But besides, as Baha'u'llah Baha says, you can't, you can't solve the problems, uh, uh, present problems with the old uh, remedies. You just cannot. So, here is the, by the way, do, do you guys recognize this picture? What is that? This is where we had this, the whole series of race um, killings in the United States and people got together. So given the crushing weight, this is House of Justice. This is House of Justice, this is so many years have passed of the coming of the beloved Baha'u'llah. And look where we are so far. As Baha'is, we need to move. Look at the mind, I say to myself, look at mindfulness business. They got it off the ground so wonderfully. They took it and they sold it to the market. You know what Abu Baha says? He says, take this Joseph. He's referring to Baha'u'llah. 
take this Joseph to the market and sell it. We, we've got to be good salespeople to know what to do. <laughs> Not sitting there passively and let things just pass by. Um, the Hazard Justice, given the crushing weight of the ills burdening the peoples of the world and seeing that a veritable cry of anguish is issuing more loudly from the hearts of those who long for some hope of relief, we, his avowed servants, can neither falter nor fail in this primary and urgent duty. We can't, but we are. Um, <laughs> Rumi's story <laughs> of friendship of the bear. Oh, this I love. How many of you know this? Dusi Khalakhersen, the Persian saying. Yeah, the friendship of the bear. Anyway, I, I teach it to my, um, to my empowerment kids at the school, but I have a different angle for it. So this, this guy is traveling and he um, comes across a bear. And the bear says, can I be your friend? I would love to be your friend. Look me, I'm so strong, I'm so tall. Anybody comes near you, I'm going to whack him. He says, that sounds good. <laughs> sounds friend, why not? So he says, come along. So they go. So halfway he is tired, he wants to rest. And uh, the bear says, don't worry, you just go to sleep. I'll stand guard. He says, mm, okay. So, <laughs> after a while, a, a fly comes and wants to sit on his mat and just shoot the fly. And, so, and then, for a few seconds later, the fly comes back again and the flies off. You know, very persi persistent. Um, you should learn from them. Uh, so, he said, shoot. And anyways, so finally, the bear is really getting angry. He is mindful of the fact that he's angry, but he is angry. He's not going to change it. He's going to keep it. Because that's going to be useful as an ammunition. Next time this fly comes, he's going to have it. So the fly comes and comes and whoop, sits right there. And the bear is ready. He's got a boulder in his hand, and there he goes, wham! What do you think happens to the fly? The fly flies. <laughs> what did that have to the head of his friend? <laughs> Smooshed. <laughs> so basically, I think Rumi is saying, you know, we have these two people within us. We got a bear, which is no brain and all force, <laughs> and, and then also a man who's supposed to have spiritual insight and that kind of thing. He didn't exercise it. He says, you know what? You're traveling with this bear all your life. You better not let it be the one who's guarding you. Because your head is going to get smooshed. <laughs> and your marriage is going to go out the door. <laughs> okay. So mindfulness does not give us value. So he, here she says, he, this kid says, uh, he says, uh, it might not be your feng shui, but it's my feng shui. <laughs> and all of you have kids, you can relate to that. Because human brain can only grasp a vague notion of what actually exists out there. And we document, this is um, Andrew Neuberg, the God, how God changes her, the neuroscientist. He says, we document how the brain uses its perceptions to build useful models of the world, other people, morality, and God. That means each one of us, every human being out there, is using their own useful model of reality, which does not agree with us. That's why we have the problems we have in the world. Everybody is in disagreement with everybody else. Because that's why religion has become the cause of this unity, because each one of us have a God we worship that is ours. And Andrew uh, Norbert acknowledges that. But how long has come to take that away, to erase that, to help us to join? So, well, this is from Abdul Baha. He says, some thoughts are useless to man. They're like waves moving in the sea without result. But if the faculty of meditation is bathed in the inner light and characterized with divine attributes, the results will be confirmed. So we need to turn to the writings, really, in order to make our mindfulness and meditation being guided. It's like, you want to have an orchestra? What do you need? A conductor. Have you ever seen a, a whole bunch of people who play beautifully but come together, no conductor? It's chaos, right? And that's how our world is. Um, the other thing which I really would like for us to appreciate, this is a story from the um, Islamic dispensation about a, a, a Arab, in, a Bedouin, who comes across in the desert, across a little 
um, um, pot of water, just a little well full of mud and everything. And he had not seen water for such a long time. To him, it's so precious. 